It's always a, a bit of a challenge to make a start when you're given some good questions to begin with, um, and then we put a group of leaders together at tables. Um, but I'll introduce myself for those of you that don't know me. My name's Alastair. Um, I've got the joy of um, being the principal of Adelaide Botanic High School, so we had a lovely walk through the Botanic Gardens to get here this morning, which is a lovely way to start the day. And it's also a great way to sort of uh, get rid of some of those thoughts that you had last night about what the hell are we doing this for? Um, but I think you know, a really important part of today is that it's a great opportunity for schools to share a little bit of the why that explains the what of what they do. Um, and I'm hoping that that really comes out of each of our presentations, that you get an understanding of the why, the why aspect. Um, the other part that was really important for me as I was thinking about this was that I probably wouldn't spend quite as much time on the context as I am this morning, because the context of our school at Adelaide Botanic really does shape what we've done. Um, but it's also a context that in some ways is a little bit different. So I thought, just as a bit of a lead into that, um, for those of you that don't know, the school is the first vertical high school in the state. It has seven levels, one under, underground, uh, which we changed from basement to foundation, it sounded nicer. Um, but seven levels, um, it is 13,000 square metres of learning space, uh, which when you look at it from a horizontal school is not dissimilar, but it's all on a tiny postage stamp footprint. And so that, that alters it a bit. Um, when we're full, 1,250 students. Um, it won't be 1,251. Um, the building is certified for 1,250. So that's a little bit different in that um, you can't stretch it out um, and add more students to it. And we can't add on to it. Um, it's actually at its maximum. It was designed originally for 1,000 students. And then the Year 7 um, agenda came along. Um, and so it had an additional layer put on it. So it's now at its absolute maximum. We opened in 2019, and we opened with years eight and nine. Um, and if you think about that from a practical perspective, um, taking year nines um, and thinking about why they would leave a school three months into starting year eight uh, to pick another school, um, that had some complexities attached to it. Um, and it's a school that's planned, obviously, for seven to 12. And the other part is that it's the first of our department schools that's a five-star green star school. So it has a very low carbon footprint. We have no parking on site, including that for the principal. Um, and so every staff member is expected to either walk, cycle, catch public transport, or find parking somewhere around the city. Um, and that's working beautifully, um, but a, a major cultural shift for our teaching staff who have been very used to rolling up and parking and getting out of their cars. Um, in terms of location, awesomely located. Um, and I, I wanted to mention that because that sits very strongly as part of our context. Um, it's located in a precinct that if we didn't connect to that precinct would be criminal. So we've got the universities next door, we've got the botanic gardens, the zoo, we've got the precinct on North Terrace which ranges right from the sort of the museums, lot 14, um, art gallery and then as we head up further on the precinct um, all of the health facilities that sit on the, the further part of um, the the north. And so really for us, part of our context is that the school was designed to have approximately 20% of the student learning actually connected to the precinct. And in our second year, we're getting pretty close to achieving that. If you look at the, the building itself from a, a vertical perspective, it's also a building that if you look at the white concrete around it, that's our property. Anything green doesn't belong to us. Um, anything green is parklands. And so if you think about the complexities of our young people playing around people that are having picnics, um, people who have had a little bit too much from the night before and are just thawing out for the following day, um, there's some real complexities around our young people actually being in a shared space. And it is a real change of mindset for us around child protection and how we actually work in that environment. So again, that's quite a significant part of our context. The other part that, um, and this part is the part that I, I absolutely love. Um, having been involved in a STEM works build, um, one of the issues for me was that notion of building a building before you've actually worked out what the learning's going to look like within it. In our particular scenario, the school was designed after the teaching and learning had actually been formulated, discussed and planned. So if you look at that little chart, you'll see that there's a really clear understanding of the teaching and learning. The built form was then to respond to that. So when you look at the, the built form component of it, you can start to see flexible learning areas, collaborative spaces, you know, anywhere, anytime learning. 
So in many ways, the school has all of those bits in one building rather than as many of us have worked in where we've got sections of our schools that can do that um, and then we're trying to knock out walls and do things in other spaces. So very much designed for that. And if you look at just one particular floor plate of the school, you can start to see that the learning areas, and if you look at that one, I think it's uh, art, uh, you can see you've got learning areas are paired, but you can also see the, the areas at either end of that are connected. So effectively, you can have four, equivalent of four classes in one space where it feels like a single space. And then you can close up the, the glass walls and have a single class, or you can have multiple versions of it. So when you look at it from a contextual perspective, it then is compelling that we needed to actually design some learning and a timetable that actually took into account all of those elements. The last part is a misconception. There's, there's often this sense that, ah, uh, but it's a school that picks off the best kids. I can tell you 100%. It's this inner city school that brings its students in from this zone. And we're in a shared zone with Adelaide High School. So as a family, they can choose either school. But if you look at the suburbs that we draw upon, uh, we have some pretty significant social ills in some of those areas that we deal with. Uh, we've also got kids from very indulged and um, you know, very well-financed uh, families. So it is a complete mix of students. The other part, as a, as a new school, um, it really had a mandate that it was to be futures focused. And our tagline really you know, lends that, that concept of tomorrow today, making what we do today relevant in tomorrow's world. So it was a really critical part that as we designed the learning and as we designed a timetable, these things had to become part of it. I wanted to take you here. And eventually you have to think about where did we start? And it's actually quite a daunting task when you actually have no timetable you haven't got anything to fall back on, that your first timetable is going to need to be your best timetable because people are having a look at that, um, and you're actually designing it from scratch. So my, my dining room table had multiple sheets of paper on looking like this during that stage. We had a team of three people at that particular point, so it wasn't a big team, um, and really started looking at what are the absolute key things that we needed to understand to actually drive forwards with a timetable. And I think what it really highlighted to me was the shift in our roles as principals. And in many ways, it took me back to the way that they refer to principals in England. They're still referred to in some schools, obviously headmaster in the independent system, but in the public system, quite often referred to as the head teacher. And it really took me back to thinking about our roles as head teachers. You know, how are we planning the learning and how are we bringing the HR, the spaces and all of those things together to achieve a particular set of outcomes? And what's our underlying principles, our first principles with that? So you'll see that there were lots of scribblings that our team had to come to grips with as we worked through some of this. Some of the scribblings got worse. Um, and that started to work on the basis of, well, how do we start connecting some of these things and how do we actually make sense of some of them? And I have to say right from the start, I'm not a timetabler. And I think our roles as principals have shifted. You know, we've now gone from handing something over to a timetabler and saying, get these people with these classes, to actually having a really great understanding of what it is that we're going after, as Peter said. So if I, if I look at what we were going after, I've tried to summarise these, but there were multiple other things. But these are the ones that I really wanted to highlight this morning. The first one was having a really, really clear understanding of what your curriculum's about. And for us, it was around what we refer to as a purposefully connected curriculum. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a few moments. The second one was that we wanted, in our particular scenario, for no teacher to teach alone or plan alone. That all of our staff would work in teaching teams and that we would have team teaching. And in many ways that gave us the opportunity to look at that deprivatisation. But we also saw that the difference that occurred between two classrooms in one school was often far greater than the difference between what occurred in two classrooms in two schools. And so we really wanted to bring that together. The third one, was one that was really interesting. We visited a school in Victoria uh, called St. Luke's, um, and it's in Maslow Park, I think it is. But when we visited the school, it also was a startup school, and the principal was adamant that 
you do not give any more time to the Australian curriculum than it either deserves or requires. And it was a really interesting statement that we spent a lot of time unpacking. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment, explain what we did with that. The other thing we wanted was for our students to have voice and choice within the curriculum. How do we actually do that within a timetable? And it's you know, particularly challenging in the middle years. We also wanted to bring the capabilities to the fore and also develop a learner profile as students travel through the school. So they, they became the driving factors. Now there were many other things in there as well. You know, there, were, there were aspects around wellbeing, there were aspects around a whole range of other factors, but they were, they were really the, the big ticket items. So I want to start first one um, around the curriculum. At Adelaide Botanic, um, and I haven't got enough time to explain it properly, there's that frustration that sits with me at this point, but I'll try and explain it fairly quickly. Our learning areas are divided up into four. So traditionally you'd have your eight Australian curriculum learning areas. We have four learning areas within the school. So we have STEM, which brings together the science, the maths and the technology. We've got global perspectives, which brings together the English, languages, HASS. Um, we've got the arts, obviously bringing together the performing arts, visual arts, etc., And lifestyle choices, which brings together the notion of health, PE and food technology. They are our four learning areas. They each have a coordinator that leads those learning areas and all of the staff work within those learning areas in teams. So on a student timetable, they won't see English or maths or things of that kind. What they'll see is either STEM or global perspectives, the arts and lifestyle choices. And people often say, you know, is the, is the curriculum project based? Yep. Is it transdisciplinary? Yep. Is it interdisciplinary? Yep. Um, and so what we stuck with was that our curriculum is a purposefully connected curriculum. The notion of that is that we make relevant connections or purposeful connections where they are needed. And the only way that you can do that easily or effectively is by bringing those teams together. Now we've obviously in our early phase been challenged that you can make those connections in STEM or global perspectives or the arts, et cetera. But now as we're maturing, we're starting to make them across those learning areas. And even in DayMap, we now have the Australian curriculum tagging ability so that we can actually tag the Australian curriculum so that we're not missing out on actually tracking whether we're covering the things that we need to cover. So that's a really important part of it. I'd love to spend more time on that, um, but I'm hoping that kind of gives you the picture that we have these four learning area teams that when a student goes to a particular uh, time of learning, they will be in that particular team. The key thing for us, though, was that each teacher in that team is not trying to teach the other discipline. So, for example, when a student is working in, for example, global perspectives, the English teacher is the discipline expert. The history teacher is the discipline expert. And it's not about trying to get the English teacher to teach history and every other part of it, language, all those components. So it was really important to maintain that passion and interest of the teacher. Also want to come to the Australian curriculum part. That was a real challenge. When we looked at most schools and we were starting to look at um, people's timetables, we were seeing that there was a line of home ec, a line of language, a line of art, a line of maths. No wonder it got busy and crowded. So we really started from that notion that 80% of our curriculum would be Australian curriculum, full stop. And if you start looking at the numbers that are attached to it, you can start to see that as we look at years eight, nine and 10, and you know, as we're starting to add year seven to that, there are some prescribed times or recommended times. And if we stick to some of those, we can actually keep it to that 80%, but it doesn't come without wailing and screaming. So if you start looking at those percentages, you know, English at 12%, maths 12%, science 10%, arts, and so on. But you add those up, that gives you your 80%. That's looking at a year eight version. What we then started to do, I've got to look up here because I can't read it. What we then started to do was look at the balance of that time, taking it into each of those four learning areas. So what you'll see is that on our timetable, 30% of the time is allocated to STEM, 30% is allocated to global, 10% to the arts, which was actually an increase in 2% if you actually take it in real numbers, and also for responsible uh, or lifestyle choices, um, we ended up with 10% uh, there. So that, that gives us our 80%. That's a major challenge. 
because now you're starting to think, well, if that's the case, yeah, is one more important than the other? How do we allocate time as a result of it? I won't answer that just yet. The other part was, well, what do you do with the other 20%? And that's where the choice and voice component came into it. We wanted our kids term by term to actually have real choice and a real voice in their learning. So we introduced what we refer to as studios. It came out of a concept of a school in China that we saw, um, but one of the things that we wanted was our students to be able to select these studios term by term, but the studios weren't an ad hoc elective approach. So if you have a look at some of the offerings there, you'll see things like Extreme Maths, Chinese Next Level, All That Glitters, and it's got some great names. But really, the students were starting to pick those because what it enabled them to do was to take the learning that was occurring within the Australian curriculum and take it one step further, or one step different. And so the students actually have a full day on a Wednesday of studios. And I'll show you how that works in a moment. The other part that was a, cri a critical part of this is that the studios are not assessed A to E. So that means that 20% of the curriculum at our school is not assessed A to E. It's actually assessed against the capabilities. So the students eventually develop a capability map where they're actually starting to select their studios based on the capabilities and those capabilities that they want to develop. The parents have been very accepting, but one of the things that we're seeing is an absolute highlight of this is that we've got kids who are struggling in maths, doing extreme maths, and doing extremely well. Interesting that when you take away the assessment component based on an A to E, they're prepared to give it a real shot and really get out of their comfort zone and do some different things. When they then move back into STEM, they're actually moving back in with a far more positive mindset because they know that they can be successful in some of those areas. So it's really shifted the mindset around some of that. So how do, we, how do we break it down in terms of time? What we looked at was that we didn't design a timetable based on lines. Timetable is totally based on blocks of 80 minutes. And so when you have a look at, for example, STEM, over a week, that's six 80-minute blocks. When you have a look at global perspectives, that's six 80-minute blocks. When you look at the arts and lifestyle choices, you'll see that there's two 80-minute blocks. And when we look at the studios, there are three 80-minute blocks. And then we have a Studio One, which is our studio which really focuses around child protection, well-being, career development, those kind of things. So that's the breakdown of time. Now, I can already sort of imagine some of your thinking. We started with staff coming into this school. So we had an opportunity to say, this is how we're going to actually approach this. We didn't have the legacy items of art has a line, French has a line, English has a line, PE has a line, home ec has a line, etc. So we were able to start with that. The other part, though, was that I think in hindsight, if I was also at my previous school, I probably would have done a similar thing and stepped right back and said, you know, we actually need to begin again rather than keep messing with the current structures that we've got. So that was a challenge. The next challenge was moving into year 10. So with year 10, the students from year seven through to nine have studios. From year 10 onwards, those studios then convert into choices so that those students then have a, a greater range of choices within that time. I will just say that with the studios, they are cross age group. And that was a real challenge in the first instance, having year eights and nines in the same studio. What we found was it lifted the game of the year nines because the year eights were generally outperforming them. Um, and it was a really interesting concept to think about bringing those two together. So year 10 obviously changed that a little bit, and year 11, which we don't have currently, but we're planning for next year, um, has again been a challenge. And what we're looking with year 11 is, again, the 80-minute blocks of time, and you can see the breakdown of it there. You'll get a copy of this, so you don't need to take shots of all of the parts. Um, but you can see the breakdown there, but what you'll also see is that the research project we're planning on running as a full day on Wednesday. So on Wednesday, we'll have our Studio One and the research project as a full day. Why? Because our kids are well connected with our precinct. Already, we've got them working with STEM ambassadors in the university, doing a whole range of different things. That notion of coming to three or whatever number of blocks of time just didn't make sense. So a research Wednesday does make sense. There'll be kids working at home in a workshop. There'll be kids working at school, kids working within the precinct. So that, that made a lot of sense. 
Trying to pull it all together will give you a little bit of a notion of where the bits link, but as we move through from eight, and we haven't got year seven on here at this stage, but year seven will look very similar to year eight. As you move through, you can start to see the way in which some of those choices increase, that customization. The one that we're really excited about though, you'll see a thing called Studio Plus on the year 11 part. We're making one of those choices, one of those choices where we can really do something different. So on that Research Wednesday, the idea is that once the research, finished, research project's completed in the first semester, the second semester, that Research Wednesday still exists, but the, cho the choices that students have on that particular day are quite different. And I'll show you some of the thoughts. I think I've got that on the next slide. So some of, the, some of the things that we're thinking of is really getting our kids to think about that Wednesday as a flexible day where they can engage with things such as uh, you know, STEM launches where they're really launching into some of their stage two thinking but in a, in a safe environment as part of that. Some entrepreneur work where they can actually work within their startup businesses that bring together and link together some of the learning from various learning areas. So it's really trying to challenge that notion of having to go to a particular class to do that. The other idea is that it, it brings our teams together, our teachers together in teaching teams, and the notion that they won't have a single teacher for the research project, but a team of teachers working with them throughout that day um, brings that to light as well. If I move on and just take you then to what a day looks like for a student, it's a little bit different. Our kids start at 9.25 awesome time to start the day. All right, but they start at 9.25. And if you have a look at it, they have four blocks of time, 80 minute blocks of time, and there is a transition time or a break between every one of those blocks. They have a connect group time in each of the mornings. But what you'll also see is on Wednesday, they start the day with Studio One at 10.15, so a little bit later on a Wednesday and then they go through into their three studios um, and our day finishes at four o'clock. Our break time's a little bit different. So our first break is our long break because that's when kids actually need to eat complex carbohydrates, fats, those foods that help them sustain their learning rather than the snacky sugary foods. And then they have their shorter break in the afternoon. The bit that's different, and probably the most powerful part of the evil plan. When we first started looking at this, we realized that one staff meeting a week as a PD session just could not work in this scenario. So our teaching staff agreed through our PAC, start at 8.25 every morning. From 8.25 through until the time the students start, even though we have a little gap, is what we call our collab time. That is the time that we meet either in teams, as a whole staff, a variety of different ways, but it's that particular time where we meet and do the work that we need to do. If you add it up, it's 19 extra student-free days a year. We have zero after-school meetings, so at four o'clock, every staff member is free to go. No staff member is being forced to think differently and creatively and innovatively after four o'clock because they've had a hard day of working. Also, because we catch public transport and a variety of commitments with that, it respects that notion. I don't think we could operate without that time. I don't think our staff would want at this stage to operate without that time. So it's enabled them to really prepare every single day. Now, let me get this straight. It's not non-instructional time. So that collab time, every single moment of it is actually committed to a variety of learnings, teamwork, a whole range of different things. So that, that for us was fairly critical. But it only worked because we had a really strong and very clear charter about what it was that we're going after. And so that's really driven so much of the work that we're doing, a real understanding around the pedagogy, a real understanding around the teaching and learning, the way that we work together. You can access that. I've put a QR, link, a QR code up there which will give you access to basically everything about us. Um, but it needs to be taken on face value that we're a school that's just getting close to one and three quarters years old. And so we're not going to have everything right, 
But what we've tried to do is we've really tried to look at every aspect of our timetable and go, can we do this in a way that's different, that doesn't require the legacy that occurs within a school? Interesting aspect, though, is every teacher brings that legacy. So what we talk about is unlearning, unlearning from a previous school and then putting it together in this context. I want to finish with one little challenge. And this comes out of a, there's a, a Queensland uh, document that was put out in, I think, 2014, which was about creative timetabling. And when I was at the stage of having to think about this for the school and not being a timetabler, I was looking for every resource I could find, and this was pretty good. But one of the things that we've not achieved, um, but certainly is on our agenda, when you look at that notion of speed being distance over time, if we give kids a fixed amount of time, then we know that their learning is not all going to occur in the same way at the same time. I think what we've really got to be challenged about is how do we get kids to all travel the same distance, but to do that, the time has to vary. And that's something that we don't do well. So effectively, when we design our learning and we design our timetables, it's often truncated and we get that distribution curve. And that distribution curve basically tells us that some kids have traveled further in that time and less further in that time. What we've got to think about is try to design our structures where the amount of time allows every student to reach that standard, rather than us cutting that off and saying, well, they didn't reach it in this amount of time, so therefore that's, that's who they are, where they're at, etc." So that's a real challenge and one that we've not been able to solve at this stage, but it's certainly on our agenda and one that we're working really hard to look at. The other part is that we visited um, a place in Sydney and a guy there, Tim Brown, had this really lovely quote. And he was actually referring to when you dwell in spaces. And I think also when you dwell in the space of timetabling, you actually need to think about it. If you're in a truly new space, you won't always know the answer. And that's really important to hold your ideas lightly. You won't always know the answer. Your team won't either. And you're going to venture into the unknown together where curiosity really needs to be the thing that leads that charge. And that notion of curiosity is absolutely critical in terms of how do you actually think differently, how do you explore differently, and how do you leave behind some of the things that hold you back with that. So hopefully that's been a little bit of a challenge. It's a very hard job to go through that in a short period of time without going into too much detail, but it was really just to try and give you some triggers to think about things a little bit differently um, and to be challenged by them. Um, in terms of questions, obviously we're going to try and manage that, and I've brought Ryan, who is actually the person that makes a lot of this actually work, uh, with me, so if it gets too hard for me, I'm certainly going to throw to him. But maybe if you want to take just two or three minutes to have a little bit of a chat amongst your tables in terms of what are some of the challenges or questions or things that you'd like to know more, um, and we'll certainly work our way through that. Okay, in terms of... In terms of managing the questions, Peter, I'm assuming that to ask a question, we're going to need to come up to one of these two microphones. Who's got the first question? Because you don't want it to be mine. Go gently. Hello. How does VET fit into your timetable? Yeah, look, it's, it's interesting because at the moment, because we don't have year 11s, uh, we're planning for next year. Um, and I have to be absolutely honest with you, we're kind of going through an interim year for next year, as you're aware, with the new vet in schools approach. It's going to be quite different with the in, and I've got to get this right, in vetro, not in vitro, in vetro. Um, we've actually got to, we've actually got a lot of work to do around that. So at the moment, next year is kind of an interim version of that, where we're supporting students around that uh, Wednesday. Um, and supporting them through that. But, yeah, it, it's literally a holding pattern for one year for us uh, before we start looking at the new funding model for the, the new vetting schools approach. Um, yeah, your green space, like you've got young people there and you said you had to ma manage it as far as a, it's in the Botanic Gardens, basically. How do you manage it? Um, we have highly visible staff um, in incredibly um, iridescent um, vests that are out there as part of it. 
Um, what we've had to work on is some real authority to talk to people about the fact that we've got young people out there um, and it's our job to keep them safe. Um, and it's really interesting, most people are pretty good when you're dealing with young people, it's adults they don't like. Um, so most people so far have been really good with that. We do have obviously linkage to security. Um, so if we actually do need to remove somebody that's you know, giving the students a hard time, then we can do that. But the part that I will say is that, you know, how many of you have ever been to Frome Park for a picnic? Very few. Um, and if you go to the Botanic Park, you generally go to the bit that's over on the zoo side. It's absolutely quiet around there, it's beautiful. What we're challenged with though is as Lot 14 grows, and we've got a lot of connections with Lot 14, um, we're going to see a little bit more traffic through it. So it is going to be a challenge, but I think what we've, what we've learnt is already most of the interactions have been really positive. Um, and that's been something that we've you know, been quite surprised about. And where we've had one or two less positive ones, uh, we've been able to deal with those very quickly and we've developed systems and are developing systems to actually move into the building very quickly if we need to as well. Yeah, um, it's interesting. We, we tried to design that time so that it really was around our, our professional growth. So we run our PDP meeting time through that and our PDP groups are cross groups. I, I, one thing I did forget to mention was that our SSOs are part of every single bit of our PD. Um, what, we, what we worked out or planned to work out was that if you're going to support our young people, you actually need to know what it is we're doing and how we do it. So our, our SSO team are a part of that as well, um, and there's no differentiation between them. And so during that collab time, um, you know, we'll do a variety of things. We'll work in learning areas um, and in learning area teams. Um, we do a lot of whole school professional learning during that time. Um, we do a fair, Ryan, help me out on here. I, th I think what's really lovely about it is you don't have that once a week burst where you've got to cram everything into it. Um, and what we've, what we've worked really hard on doing is not timetabling it for the whole year. So we do it three or four weeks in a row where people know what's coming up, but we've got that flexibility. So it's not that you know, every Monday we've got learning areas, every Tuesday we've got, um, we mix it about a lot. Um, so there is not a level of you know, complacency around when things are going to occur. Just coming back to the SSO side of things as well, I will point out that we've made sure that we actually free our leaders up. Um, we've, we've, em we've employed some very, very talented SSOs. And so with our curriculum leaders, any of their management role is now actually undertaken with an SSO. So it actually frees them up to actually lead their learning area teams. So any of those things that really consume time that shouldn't, then they're actually taking that role. So it is quite interesting to see our SSOs in classrooms, actually teaching classes, um, doing a whole range of things, because within our classes, our classes are around about 75 to 90 students per class. Um, that class then has three or four staff allocated to it, so that's how you get that connected learning environment. And then they manage that time. So where you see those six 80-minute blocks, they manage that time. And it may be that for a particular week, it is an absolute focus around a particular project that they're working on, or it might actually be a particular focus around mathematics that is explicit, and they're working on that. So they manage those six 80-minute blocks of time. So the students are not going to you know, an English or a, a history, um, and the way that the learning occurs, they're quite often seeing that blending. The work that's really made it powerful is using DayMap to actually tag the Australian curriculum means that we can then work through that. The students only get two reports, um, and they're pretty basic um, because the parents are getting live reporting as the students travel through, and then we're tracking that task by task through Power BI. So, so we're not missing those opportunities. Hopefully I answered that, plus a few other things.
can you share any learnings around, um, I suppose you talked about staff and kids having to unlearn, flipping the longer break first, and then obviously having four 80s, like, you know, people don't come with that experience, like um, some highlights of setting up that way um, and maybe some speed bumps along the way, if they're ready. Yeah, look, I think there's, there's a mountain of learnings. Um, probably the first one is that as teachers, it's not natural to work in teams. Um, we thought it was, it's not. Um, and I think the other part is that every single day you're on your A game because you are working in a team. You can't close the door and just have one of those, it was a bad night and I'm going to just have a quiet lesson. Um, so you are on your A game. So that's why that collab time is so significant. Um, so the team protocols, um, and working in teams, actually moving through the building. So learn where, where teachers work, their prep spaces are not separated from the students, and so they work in those teams, in those spaces, but then they move as they change teams. Um, I think really the, the significant part of learning is just how unprepared teachers were for working together um, and how much support that they've actually had to do or have to do that. The outcome of it, though, is phenomenal. Um, you know, if you think about it as a student who might struggle in mathematics, having three or four people at your, um, you know, as a resource in a single class is quite powerful. So we quite often hear our students talking about the fact that, yeah, I really didn't understand it, but I, then I went to go and talk to David and he explained it a little bit better. Um, they've got that notion of being able to move uh, between people to work that out. The one thing that we have learnt, though, is that as students move into the school, they're as fixed as adults. They've had seven years of training. And you know, in many ways, when we took our first group of students in, we hadn't factored that well enough. And so we moved them into this environment. And you know, we had parents going, they can't cope. They've got to move. We've got to go somewhere else. It was a real challenge. So we've had to look at that soft approach. Um, but a relentless one, educating the parents is as important. Um, the other thing around the break times is that their stomachs have been trained to eat a particular way for seven years. Um, so again, that takes a little bit of time to change. But I, you know, I'd have to say that the calmness that occurs by having the, the larger break earlier and the food that is of the more complex type has made a dramatic difference. You don't get that, especially with some of the boys, you don't get that dramatic dip that you get when they've stuffed down you know, a whole lot of sugary foods and you know the snack type foods. The other thing is that the 9.25 start is so calm. Um, we did it because we wanted our students to have access to public transport, bike lanes, um, less foot traffic, um, and to really take a, a positive action around the notion that our young people actually start better at that time. Um, and it's made such a huge difference. You know, lateness is not a major factor. Yeah, we still have kids that are late, but you'll have that every time, um, but it's far less. Um, and what we've also seen is that they take a greater responsibility for getting to school at that time. The parents have said it's calmer at home, so it does make a, a, a much nicer start to the day. And the other part is that our staff, every single day of the week, are well prepared for our students coming in. And when we're doing that heavy lifting around our thinking and creativity, that's happening at a time when we're freshest and not at the end of the day. Our year seven kind of open night just recently and we had some of our uh, our teachers who started this year at, at Adelaide Botanic come in on a bit of a QA and a unscripted and all of them said that it was a massive learning curve coming to the school but um, the, the teamness, the, the amount of time they spend working in teams and teaching in teams and planning in teams was the thing that got them, um, that, that enabled them to take that steep learning curve in their stride. So. Alistair, has there been any tension between learning areas in terms of the amount of time that's been allocated to each one? Yeah, look, I, I think if we'd started with a larger staff, there would have been. Um, because we started with a small team, when we actually made those decisions, we basically had the um, learning area leaders as part of our team. Um, and we had long, long discussions around it. But because there was a real understanding around the 
overall impact rather than just looking at it from your own learning area, there was a real acceptance. So when, when we started bringing staff on board, it wasn't about staff coming on board and going, oh, we don't like this, it should be like this. It was really making sure that the induction process was 100% clear on what we do and why we do it and why, why we have it the way we have it. Um, and it is a challenge because when you look at the arts, for example, and you look at the, you know, the, the health and PE component, you know, traditionally in a school there would be a line of those and a line of something else. Um, so when you have a look at the studio component, that's sort of really the bit that sold it. So the students that wanted to do more of an arts focus can do that through the studios. And they can do it at a high level, it's not an elective. If, you know, and one of the things that was really interesting is that we've seen more students want to progress with language than I've ever seen before because in the studios, they weren't held back in a classroom or a class setting with the language with a group of students who just don't want to do it. They had that opportunity to then select a studio where they could really take that language forwards. And so that, you know, that language next level was one of the studios. It gave them that opportunity to go that step further. So we're really seeing the studios as a way of taking those levels further. But especially for our, our teachers in those particular parts, we've got, a, um, we've got a studio called Run Forest Run. And it's, um, it was really interesting. We actually had no idea that kids had no idea what Run Forest Run meant. Uh, so it was old people designing that one. Um, I think they thought it was like a walk in a forest or something. But, um, but what we saw with that was a massive number of kids who really had that sort of sport PE focus wanting to pick that. So it gave them the opportunity to do those things, but in a, a more concentrated way, and in a way with a group of people that were really targeting it because they wanted to do it. So I think in many ways the studios have done that. The spin-off effect is that we're seeing our kids come to school wanting to learn more about those things, and not having the um, A to E grading has really freed them up to explore it further. Wednesdays are just delightful. We have our highest staff attendance and our highest student attendance on a Wednesday. Um, and that tells us something about the studio program and how that's working. It's a, it's a you know, Ryan started with hair with us, um, but it's, it's a term by term process where the students actually pick their studios term by term. So it's, you know, our timetabling is all the time. We're actually now reviewing that and looking at it semester by semester, but we wanted them to have that real choice and voice because our kids come into year eight and they're locked into their choices, and that's it. They do a whole year of it, and a year as a year eight is a hell of a long time. So that notion of being able to select things as you travel through the year and as your interests develop and as some of your interests wane is a really important thing. So that really brought that choice and voice component into it. And then within the learning aspect, within you know, each of the learning areas, there's a significant amount of choice as well. Alastair, I'm going to make this the last question and I'm going to have to limit you in terms of time in answering it. So Perfect. I, I do apologise. So um, for those who, of you who don't know, uh, Alastair in his, part, in, in his spare time uh, represents uh, public schools on the SACE board. Yep. Uh, so we've all been introduced to the, the SACE board strategic plan 2020 to 2023. Um, there's a future that we're encouraged um, to help co-create and, and part of that is uh, a commitment to assessing and developing the capabilities uh, and also you know, moving towards a learner profile um, aligned to um, an ATAR. So uh, you've done some work in this area. So any thoughts about, um, you know, from the learning of the studio experience, how that can be ramped up so that capabilities can be part of a, a senior school program uh, and I know, also know that you're part of a learner profile trial. Um, if you've got time, you could share yeah, it. Yeah, look, there's two bits, and I might rope um, Ryan in on part of it. We really wanted to bring the capabilities to the fore, but what we understood was that as a teaching group, we actually knew very little about the capabilities. We knew the big ticket headings, um, but we actually, once you actually dug into them, we actually didn't know the bits that sat in, inside them. So everyone can sort of recite the you know, critical and creative thinking, but then when you actually get into the bits below it, there wasn't a great understanding. So we actually had to do a lot of work unpacking those and then going, well, how do you actually assess it? So with our studios, we actually sent home a report, but it's, it really is working towards or at various levels. With the um, project that we're doing at the moment with the uh, Melbourne University or the University of Melbourne, um, we've, there's a few schools in our state working on the progressions of the capabilities. That will give us the language and the tools 
to actually observe the capabilities and then actually look at the progressions associated with it. And Ryan, I don't know if you wanted to say a few words about the, the way in which that's progressing. Yeah. So we're, we chose uh, critical thinking as the construct for our progression um, and it worked tirelessly really to, to try and get a progression that reflects the different parts of critical thinking uh, in a way that's observable but you know um, teachers are able to actually see behaviours that would indicate the, the level the students are at. And that kind of translates to what we're looking at in the middle school sort of studio program as a way of then um, better capturing the progression through the capabilities in that context. Um, so that our students, when they, when they get to senior school, are actually already really well um, used to the concept of a learner profile and uh, making choices around their learning pathway that actually develop their learner profile um, purposefully. Um, so yeah, it's kind of two, two parts of the, or two sides of the same coin, um, developing it as part of this project for the senior school and the SACE um, component and, and then also how we replicate that in the middle school. Thanks for that. Look, I will just finish off with, I feel like we've just absolutely given you a tiny bit of the surface and it's really hard to restrain myself. Um, but really the idea was to try and give you a little bit of the why as to what it is that we're doing. So thank you.